Hello, and welcome to SodaCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. I'd give you Bruce M. I love my mind tonight. Sharp, like a tack. (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, what it used to be like for me was I drank, I started drinking when I was about 14 years old uh, and got into using speed around this time. I was, um, my big thing in uh, growing up was I was into sports and, um, and I was rather slow of foot, and so I these guys I used to hang out with, they said, if you take this stuff, I'll guarantee you'll gain a step and a half to two steps on your on running. And I said, this is what I need, you know. So I used to drink uh, Take Speed, or it started off as no dose, and I used to, I didn't take like one or two, it was handfuls, and uh, drink beer. And it's like the first time... Uh, I I went out and had a what so called good time. I got really shit faced. That's a good way of putting it. And it's like that's how I drank. My whole drinking pattern was basically that way. I drank uh hard, I drank uh heavy, I drank to get drunk. I mean I just drank uh, I thought I was having a good time and I did it for fourteen years. And um and the thing uh that was a really significant, I guess, for me during my drinking years is that um, I always felt this sense that uh, once I drank and used that I had this enormous sense of belonging and and courage to go out and do whatever. Um, I was a very reckless person when I drank and used. I was was the type of person that um, became very boisterous and very loud and even very feisty. Um, I was a runner. Uh, I was the type that uh, just always on the go. I used to used to go watch sports with people in their uh, either uh, at, in their homes or or even being involved around it. And I used to stand all the time instead of sitting down in their home. I used to make people nervous. You know, I was this type of person that would just literally just stand around, always kind of bouncing, having this snap around me because I always wanted to keep my adrenaline going. And it's like um, for a long time I had a lot of denial around uh, that I had a problem with uh, with uh, booze and, and drugs. Uh, especially in the area with booze. I had three drunk drive-ins. Um, I had numerous amount of uh, speeding tickets, reckless driving. Uh, finally, after my third one, uh, in 19, uh, the right before New Year's of 78, they took my license away. This was the second time. And, uh, and it's like uh, I was just a hazard. You know, I was like an accident waiting to happen all the time. And I was uh, physically abusing myself, abusing other people. I uh, best can, can describe myself as uh, what they say, I was uh, like a tornado that whirled through the lives of others. And, um, and it's like I would never take the time out to want to look at me because if I did, I might see something that I didn't like. And it's like... Uh, Eventually, I got burned out. Uh, I I uh, first came to my first meeting in um, February of '79, about two months after I had my last drunk driving. And it's like, uh, and this I went up to uh, Peninsula Hospital up uh, in Burlingame, and it's like I identified with the idea, the, the feelings that were going on at the time at the meeting. But what it was, I still had, I wasn't drinking, but uh, 
I had such a denial system within myself that I said, well, maybe, you know, I just, if I just stay off of it for a while, it'll be okay. So I, I didn't drink for the next uh, six months, but I used, I smoked and uh, used an awful lot. And uh, the last couple of years I got hooked on this stuff called uh, PCP and uh, was smoking it quite, quite heavily and uh, taking speed on a daily basis and um, just to function. It wasn't a matter of, um, of uh, that uh, this was my favorite drug or whatever. It was just that I used this stuff just to get by, just to function. And um, in uh, se September, I got, uh, I had this job. I was a manager of a warehouse, and I was, my mannerism at the time while I was there was one of um, insanity. I was so Jekyll and Hyde. It's like at times I would uh, just seem all right and mellowed out, and then at times I would just get so furious and so irate that uh, I had a tendency sometimes with people of jacking them up against walls and uh, asking them, what's your problem, you know, never thinking that the problem was me. And um, I have a boss at this time that um, was getting pretty sick and tired of where I was at. In fact, I was doing things over his head to try to get things done on this job that um, a gentleman who i just seen recently, I hadn't seen a couple, of, like two and a half years, asked me one morning, I said, do you want help? And um, I talked to him and I said, well, you know, I got all these different functions I got to do here. You know, I got, uh, I want to get this room. And he says, you're about ready to lose this job. Do you want any help? And it's, I was still jawing around. And then finally I said, well, if you don't want it, that's fine. But if I said, if you want it, and I grabbed him by the arm and I said, yeah. So I ended up going to a recovery house up here in um, Morgan Hill. And I spent 38 days there. And they told me how to uh, actually conduct myself in an AA meeting, you know, during these 38 days. Because I really didn't, I was really uh, non-functionable. I was pretty burned out by then. And um, and since that day, since I was put there, it hasn't been necessary for me to go back out. And uh, And what I've been embarking on is this journey. And this journey has, um, I would say, been different. But uh, I would say very, at times, very rewarding and very um, <laughs> coming out on the other side of, uh, of situations. Um, I've gotten an opportunity in sobriety to get into life. Like I really, I guess what I really wanted to do all the time. And it's like, um, it didn't come right away. Uh, I was a slow starter in this program to the point that, um, I, I like pain and it's like, I knew it well. And it's like, it took me about a year and a half in this, in this, uh, program and I don't recommend it. But it's, uh, it took me a year and a half in this program to get sick and tired of where I was at and start to go on living. And it's like, um, because I, I looked at this as this was the end of the road. You don't have any more good times. And what, and what I find out here is I lied to myself and what, and uh, you can really get into the joy of living in this program. And, uh, it was just one day I was, I, I felt like I was near that point where, I wasn't making it sober, and I wasn't, uh, and I knew I couldn't make it drunk. So I just got on my knees and I asked for help, and I got it. And uh, and since then, I've been embarking in the joy of sobriety. Now I haven't said I won't, haven't gone through problems, and it's like life gets very, very real, and that's the thing that I really ran from uh, for the. For the 28 years 
or uh, that uh, I ripped and run because I didn't want to deal with me. But uh, you come here and you have no choice, you know. And it's like um, the one thing that is, and they have it on medallions, and if you stick around here long enough, especially for a year, you'll get one of these. And it says, to thy own self be true. And, and that's that's what it's been like to me. I've had to um, swallow some enormous pride because I'm what they call an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. And it's um, and there's a lot of times when, um, you know, I just think I got my shit together and then I find out I, how I don't. And it's just um, when you... The best thing I do is what's helped me a lot is um, finding a power greater than myself, and um, and I at first that wasn't an easy thing to do, um, because I had a real taboo about religion, and uh, and what I got told is uh, find a concept of a power that you can be comfortable with, and. Uh, and it's like uh, what it says, like in the tradition, a loving God is he may express himself in our group conscious. That's the kind of God I have. And the one thing I incorporated in this higher power was a sense of humor, because that's something I really lacked a lot. I was always so serious about life that I never would allow myself to lighten up and just go on with life. And... Uh, I'm just, uh, for the newcomers uh, and the visitor, uh, keep coming back because I guarantee this journey that you're on, This is and this is what I think is it's not how you, what, what the results of getting there, but the journey is the big deal. And, um, and I don't know what, you know, it's like I always wanted to find the map that, that would tell me what it's going to be like. But, you know, I guess what I'm finding out, just just showing up every day and getting into life is what, what it's all about. And uh, keep coming back. It works. Thank you. Speaker for the evening. And uh, here's Jerry S. Hello, my name is Jerry. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jerry. You know, um, it's interesting observing myself. I get to do that an awful lot now, where when I was filled with uh, booze and, uh, and drugs, uh, I was more participating without that observer part in me. And one of the things that I've observed tonight is um, I like to think of myself as being really tight with God. And... Uh, and so as I'm getting ready for this meeting, I'm running a, a running prayer with God. And it is, Dear God, please don't let me come from ego. Whatever happens, don't let me come from ego. Now see, my interpretation of that is the negative side of, e of ego, of uh, trying to impress you with who I am and what I've done and, you know, and just those aspects. Of course, I was doing that as I was straightening out my hair and blow drying it. It took me about a half hour. And uh, there's only one thing that I have to do, and then, then we'll get that over with. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> as much as I pray to have it removed. Okay, here we go. What is a nice person like me doing here? You ever ask yourself that? I have many, many times. And, um, you know, I, I keep on coming up with, uh, how did it happen? I mean, <laughs> where did I go wrong, if you will? Uh, and I would like to think that there was just one point in my life and it all turned from there. You know, from there on, it just turned. But the reality of it is, is that uh, the, the few years of sobriety that I have had 
have given me an opportunity to look back further and further, uh, that observer part of me, if you will. And, um, and, and today's reality is that uh, I was, quote, setting myself up uh, for the addiction of alcohol. To a lesser extent, and I'm only, I'll only say this once, but to a lesser extent, uh, to, um, to tranquilizers. But the main addiction was alcohol. And uh, I'm going to tell you a, a short story, a little bit about myself. I know you're all dying to hear it. Uh, the, um, the interesting thing to me is, is that as I'm able to look back further and further and remember more and more about my earliest years, I found that I was left alone a lot. At first, for about the first 35 years, maybe 36 or 37, a couple of early years in the program, uh, I blamed people for that. I blamed my father, and I blamed my mommy, and I blamed all of those people that I thought, you know, had a significant effect on, uh, on my growing up. For example, my mother and father divorced when I was two. And there were some years there when she didn't want to remarry. And there were some, you know, she kind of took out of, uh, or took off and had um, enjoyed her life, if you will. I think that's being fair. And uh, I think that I'm pretty much out of the judgment of that now. Uh, but I found myself, she was an entertainer. And um, I found myself spending, I, I, there aren't too many older type people here, uh, but mature, <laughs> thank you, but uh, she was a, uh, a Spanish dancer and, and danced at a place called the Sinaloa in, um, I believe it was in Oakland, I'm not sure anymore. In the Sinaloa club, above the cocktail lounge, and above the performing area, there is a little room, and I know that room with my eyes closed. And I used to, quote, at the age of four, just lay there and cry myself to sleep. Sad, huh? Night after night after night after night. Now that's, I'm telling you this because it sets up a pattern, and it was a pattern that I really didn't get an opportunity to look at until a few years into sobriety. Then my mother met uh, my stepfather, and they moved, basically they moved in this area, but prior to doing that, they moved in a place called Alameda, and it was, uh, the, the, it was a housing project, and it was right after the war. Um, the blacks and the whites, and nobody got along with anybody in that housing project. That, that would be fair to say. So somebody was always kicking ass with somebody else. And um, so I, I'm setting up that I started withdrawing a little bit more and started getting tough at a very early age. Uh, and while the dating process was going on between my stepfather and my mother, uh, needless to say, they wanted to go out and get to know each other, who they were and what have you. Uh, again, I found myself kind of like being dropped off in different places. Now, perhaps you can relate to that. Uh, perhaps that's important and perhaps it's not, but it's part of the story that develops into the character type that I became. So what I'm getting at is at a very early age, I just said, or I, I was beginning to formulate, I'm going to make it alone. No help, nothing. I'm on my own, and that's where I'm coming from. And I also realize now that I was developing walls. You know, I was constructing walls as fast as I possibly could because it was the only way I knew how to survive at that time. Some of the things that happened, uh, which I won't share with you right now, but some of the things that happened, now I can look back and now I realize, you know, that I was just becoming, quote, uh, as strong as I possibly could 
as early as I possibly could because I didn't like the disappointments that I had already seen. The um, one one other interesting aspect, and then I'm I'm going to progress as quickly as I can. When um, we all have we all have figures in our family uh, that are very important to us. Uh, and I think that it's obviously very important for the family unit. Uh, many people uh, have a good, strong family unit, good, strong family ties. Uh, I began to realize with, um, now I realize that the resentments began very early towards the stepfather for taking my mother away. And uh, that's important when you combine that with the fact that he was a practicing alcoholic. So I lost respect in a number of areas for a number of people. The first was my mother. After all, uh, she divorced my real father and uh, went out an awful lot when I was younger. Another, in other words, quote, to my way of thinking for a number of years, abandoned me. Uh, I lost respect for a stepfather um, whom I could, not, I could not see in later years as I was growing up and in the teens for not contributing to the family. Now, I'll share with you right now, this is a bunch of bullshit, okay? I mean, but it was true at that time. And it was true, and it was the, and it, it was the, it were these old tapes that I ran with for about 35 years. The only person that I had respect for in my family was my grandfather. And I used to, uh, to get to visit him occasionally. And, you know, I saw a successful man who was making it on his own. He was a successful businessman. He lived by himself. An interesting fact was I, I was later told by my mother that he was gay, and I didn't know that because I didn't read that in at that time, which means little or nothing to me now, but at the time it would have. Interesting that I would not observe that. At any rate, scratch mom, scratch dad, the only person I care to become like is my grandfather. And then he did some things and I didn't want to be like him either. Now, you can see what kind of a box I had put myself in very early. So here I am, and I'm going for it. I've always been basically a positive person, or at least I had always thought of myself as basically a positive person, until I realized what, what, was, the, uh, what was the motivation behind what I wanted to get. And I think that it's very important that I realize, and perhaps important that you might look at your motivations, mine was resentment. I am going to make it, period. I don't like you, 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 or you. I'm going for it. And so that's what I did. At 19, uh, I married and got out of the house. Seems like a slow, seems like slow times now, but... Uh, approximately 21 years ago, that seemed fast. And I set out for the business world. Now, alcohol really uh, had no bearing in my life at that time. Drugs had no bearing in my life at that time. But I did see, and, it, and I can note now, I did see my parents drinking a lot and by the way, uh, for those of you who have made the same statement that I did, I would never become like my fucking father, ever. I would never hit my wife. I would never do this. I would never do that. Da, 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 da. When I have children, I will treat them with respect as young adults, as small adults. I will not do what he has done. The interesting thing was, he didn't do that much. You know, these were all fabrications in my mind. I was never beat, <laughs> but I did get to witness, upon occasion, my father not hit, but push my mother around. Uh, 
So my mind got an opportunity to work on those things over and over and over again. I will not be left alone. I will never become like my father. I have no respect for my mother. The only person that I did have respect for, I later lost respect for. Decided when I left the house to get married. Within, let's see, married at 19, and by the time I was... Um, 26. No. By the time I was 27, had four children. And that is really interesting to me because I didn't want any one of them. At that time. But my wife kept on getting pregnant. <laughs> and being the animal that I was at that time, you know, I thought to myself, Jesus, Marcia, for... For Christ's sake, I thought you were taking the this, or I thought you were doing the that. You know, it was all her fault. It really was. And I believe that, and I believe that up until very recently. And on my off days, I believe it today. I worked for a firm called Ampex Audio. That firm and my job was very low paying, and they paid me for the use of my hands, no brains. Just perform a function, get it out into production, and produce as many as you possibly can, and get through quality control, and that's your job. And so I did that, and I did that, and for, you know, for three years until I, I just kept on thinking to myself, my God, there, you know, this is a 22. There has got to be more to life than putting a finishing polish on a tape recorder head. Introduction to drugs, actually introduction to, uh, to tranquilizers, because children were coming, marriage was not working out, stuck in a job that I did not like, and so one day I just broke down. I was throwing very expensive fixtures against concrete walls, and my foreman came up to me and he said, I think there's something wrong. <laughs> right there was something wrong got out of that job didn't care how didn't care what it cost got out of that job and entered into the field of real estate now there's an interesting thing about salesmen salesmen in the main their time is their own their income is unlimited it had all of the things that I wanted unlimited income with the freedom that I needed to do what I wanted to do. First year, terribly unsuccessful. Second year, uh, made $8,000. Third year, made fifteen, and then started shooting up. Uh, shooting up. Explain shooting up. <laughs> then started making more money. <laughs> now, I've got this terrible inferiority with money. And you see... When you couple that with a whole life situation that I didn't want but had, I decided that I was going to start going for it. One of the brokers that I worked for at the time, and I'm not, I'll try and stay out of, the, out of his inventory, but the bottom line of it is, at least to my interp interpretation at that time, was young, successful about 27, 28, 29 years old at that time, you know, lots of women, lo uh, a new Cadillac, uh, his own business, and I thought to myself, there is the role model I have been looking for all my life. And his business partner, who was also a very good friend of my father who got me in the business, was the practicing alcoholic. So I started to drink with the boys. <coughs> but you see, I was not going to abuse alcohol. But I started to drink with the boys, and I always stopped when I had reached whatever level I wanted to reach. And I started making more money, and I started driving the cads, and all of a sudden I found this tremendous need 
for blue-eyed, fair-skinned blondes with big boobs. <laughs> so I started looking for those. And before I knew it, I was spending a lot of time in the bars and a lot of time willfully breaking up a marriage and a family and thinking to myself, you know, I really understand how my dad became the person he did because my mother was a bitch. <laughs> Association. My wife's a bitch. My mother must have been a bitch. I feel sorry for my dad. And then I started drinking with my dad. Where's all this going? One year, the broker who was a practicing alcoholic fired me. But that was nothing new because he fired me about every week. And he marched me over to the bar, our favorite bar, and he said, Jerry, I want you to understand that what I'm doing for you is for your own good. You're canned. And of course, we're sitting having a couple of drinks, and I bought him another one. And I said, really, Stan? He says, yeah, I'm not kidding. You're canned. I said, okay, Stan. And at that time, I made another vow, a life built on resentments. One day, Stanley, I will have every one of your salespeople working for me. Not only that, Stanley, you will be working for me. When you realize accomplishments, the accomplishments that you make, when they finally come to realization and they're based on resentments, they're very empty. But of course, I didn't know that at the time. That happened, developed my own office by the time I was 29, developed a very, quote, successful real estate organization. And I was doing that, doing a lot of partying, and you see, by this point, partying was okay. Still, I was abusing alcohol. I was abusing drugs. But I was functioning. And I was functioning relatively well. And I was still finding time to run this organization. And so I thought to myself, you know, what the hell is the meaning of life anyway? It appears to me you got to get through it the best way you possibly can. And that's what I'm going to do. And at the time, I think it was reach for all the gusto you can. You know, and that's exactly what I did. And so, I really started not so much using, or I shouldn't say the drugs and the alcohol didn't get in, in the way as much as it did in later years, but I started to learn how to use and abuse people. Another interesting thing about becoming a salesperson, if you're any good at it at all, and even if you're not, they keep on sending you to seminars. The purpose of the seminar is to learn how to get what you want from people. At least that was my interpretation at the time. And my broker used to tell me, and I could never buy it, but in later years I did because the disease took its toll a little more. He said, you know something, Jerry? Those people have your money in their pocket. And all you have to do is figure out how to get it. Not what I would refer to as a healthy attitude. Okay, so a lot of partying, a lot of boozing. Still trucking right along. Still trucking right along. I was uh, making it home to my wife. Oh, I, you know, I'd be home couple of weeks, then I'd be gone a couple of weeks, then I'd be home. But it didn't start out that way, you see. It started out a couple of hours, and then it started out longer and what have you. The disease was starting to take its effect, and I didn't even know it. All I knew was that I was going to get ahead. You see, that was very important to me. It was important to me that somebody in my family got farther than my grandfather. Isn't that ridiculous? 
It is now. It is to me. But it was a, it was just a drive. It was just something that I can't even talk about. It was something that had to be done. Obviously, the marriage didn't work out. Obviously, I got a divorce. And now it was time. Now I was in my prime. The company had approximately 75 people. Uh, bought a Pantera, for those of you who know what a Pantera is. Red Pantera, of course. Uh, so now I had a fast car, and I decided to live life in the fast lane, and that's where I was going with it. Met a woman who later became my second wife, and that woman was in love with me. But you see, I wasn't honest with her. I mean, she became my best drinking friend, partied all of the time, went down to Manhattan Beach and, you know, and, and just just a lot of boogieing and partying. And, um, and I thought for a number of years I had told her something, but it turns out, now that I can remember a little better, that I didn't tell her one thing. And that was... I wasn't honest with her. I didn't tell her, I don't think you should get involved with me because I'm going to do everything I want. And if you get in the way, you go. Did all of the things to win her affection and love for probably a couple of years, that woman would have done anything I wanted her to do. She also made a substantial income, so, quote, that made, the di that made a, din a dynamic duel. I mention this because I was now into alcoholism fairly well. And, uh, and I really didn't care about her. I just cared about me. In fact, I didn't care about a hell of a lot of people. I just cared about me. Child support payments, why make them? I mean, after all, I didn't want the children. Uh, responsibilities to an ex-wife, who gives a shit? Parents, fuck them. New person, new relationship. Uh. I mention that relationship because it was that relationship that helped bring me to AA. You see, I had made her life so miserable for two years that when it became payback as a bitch, I suffered. <laughs> she did it beautifully. <laughs> you know, it was all of a sudden me with all of the booze and all of the, you know, and, and the tranquilizers when I wasn't using booze, going around running from pe person to person saying, I'm doing everything I possibly can. I want to settle down. I mean, I'm tired of the things that I've done. I apologize, but it was too late. And she didn't care. It's too bad. <clears throat> Made a geographical move. Went down to San Diego to try and save my marriage. Didn't work. Still drinking. Came back. For those of you that know what I'm talking about and the feelings of going through a relationship and wanting to straighten out but not really knowing that alcohol was, was the problem, um, you know what I'm feeling when I talk to you about that. So at any rate, um, by the way, when I went down, I sold the company and, you know, just and the money just went. So the bottom line of it is, is that relationship brought me to AA. I was staying with a friend, and I had contacted a doctor in the phone book. And I had told the doctor, who happened to be a psychiatrist, that I was going through a lot of stress, and I needed help. He asked me what I was doing with it, how I was handling it, what I was, you know, what I was taking to, to take care of the stress. I told him I was drinking too much. He said, well, you sound fairly coherent to me. He says, what I suggest you do is go to AA and there's a meeting right across the street. Always taking sound advice when I needed to. I mean, when it really got down to the nuts and bolts, I went to that AA meeting, went there for about 10 days, 
and decided nice people. <clears throat> but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I mean, that was my interpretation of AA. <laughs> These people are absolutely dead. Three years later, I would have done anything to get into this program. I mean anything. And I often share that with people that come up to me now, you know, and, and it's like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and uh, the reason I share that, because the time came for me when I would have crawled across broken glass to do it. The pain just got to be that unbearable. Now, I've never had a 502, and I've never been in jail. I've never gotten in trouble from that standpoint. But I think you know what I'm talking about when I talk about loneliness. Because it was lonely. And I mean lonely. Oh, God, it's depressing thinking about it. <laughs> Got back involved in AA. Went to my ex-wife, by the way. Said, you've got to help me. Stayed there for a week. Realized why I'd left her in the first place. But, <laughs> but, she put me in touch with my mother. My mom came over and said, let's get in touch with our family. The old doctor, the guy that diagnosed Osgood slaughters in your kneecap when you had, you know, when I hadn't seen this guy for a long time. And so we called the doctor, and my mother talked to him, and my ex-wife talked to him, and finally he wanted to talk to me. And he said, Jerry, what seems to be the problem? And I said, well, doctor, I said, I'm suffering from minor anxiety. Do you believe that? <laughs> minor anxiety. I was contemplating suicide on a minute basis. And I'm suffering from minor anxiety. Got to go to one of the centers. Uh, didn't uh, went to an, an alcohol clinic. I think it's on Alum Rock, or it, it's in that area. And uh, you know, I am the type. I had built. I had. I had become so out of touch with everything, you know, that I just didn't show emotions to anybody. Got there. A uh, woman counselor took me in, and we started we started to talk, and it's like I just cried. In fact, it was a racking cry. You know, it's like I can't even get the words out. And it took about it took about 25 minutes before the racks would just stop, and it was only sobs, and I could talk in between sobs, and it all came down to. I'm really afraid. Interesting statement for a person who thought he was never afraid. You know, a person from the era of the John Waynes. Yeah, I look. Yeah, it's interesting because I look now and I can tell. You can kind of tell about a person by what they read. Tarzan. Huh? Conan. Huh? The Chronicles of Mars. Uh, who was the other one? Gore. I mean, I should have known that I thought of myself as a superhero, you know? <laughs> Not me. At any rate, here I am. That's how I got, that's how I got here. What time did we start? Thank you. From some of the stories I've listened to, I'm a real Namby Pamby. But my reality of what I went through, I would not wish on anybody. I was once in an AA meeting, and we were talking about AA as a family. And it was early in my sobriety, it was about two weeks, and I was still... still filled with rage, a lot of anger and a lot of rage. But you see, I, I had learned how to hide that. You know, 
At any rate, the conversation was going around AA is a family, and it's a family that you can tell things to and you wouldn't talk to about, you know, within your own family. And I got up and I said, you know, that's right. Because I would love to tell my father I hate his fucking guts for what he did. But I can't, because I love him. It's like one of those love-hate things. Sick. That's ill. I recognize it now, but I didn't then. And when I sat down, the real reality of what I was thinking came to me. And if I don't stop, my son is going to be saying the same thing about me. Now that's important. Because you see, I've been a son. And I don't want my son to go through what I thought I was going through. And so right then and there, it was serious time. Besides that, I couldn't stand the pain anymore. <laughs> I want to talk about a spiritual experience. When a person thinks they hear the voice of God, well, no. I heard the, I heard the voice of God. God, as I understand him, early in the program. And to my way of thinking, when a person, whether it happened or not, when a person thinks they hear God speaking to them, they really should pay attention. At any rate, I was sitting in my, uh, I was reduced to staying with my family, with my, with my parents, in the den, reading the big book, second week, somewhere around the second or the third week. And as I'm reading the big book, just laying on the floor, I heard this voice. And the voice said, you know, Jerry, you can't fool around like this anymore. Now, whether or not you believe I heard, I believe I heard. And that's important to me. I got involved very quickly with something that I had always wanted to do. I got involved in spiritual meditation. I started getting some meditations that just knocked my socks off about who I was, what I had done, and where I had the opportunity to go if I just paid attention. One of the things that's very important to me because it has been significant, and I want to share this too, I used to think of myself as being very perceptive. You know, I had developed these senses as being a salesperson and all of the tapes and all of the seminars and what have you. But it's hard to be perceptive when you're filled with alcohol. It gets distorted a lot, you know. But at that time, I thought it's still, you know, I'm still intuitive or what have you. At any rate, I was doing a meditation by a... Um, by a person in the program, a person that I choose to call sponsor, and uh, got involved in meditation, went home, and I did for the first time what is called an open-eye meditation. It was in my living room, and I was sitting there meditating away, just having a great contact, and all of a sudden the voice came again, which was nothing new to me because I've been hearing this voice for almost two weeks after getting involved in program. And the voice directed me, to look at a plant that was right against the wall. And I looked at the plant, and the plant disappeared. Now, this is open-eye meditation. Again, whether it disappeared or not is totally irrelevant, but it disappeared in front of my eyes. And I went, wow. <laughs> this is going to be a heavy meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and then a voice came in and the voice said all that appears to be is not you know and I, 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 I got that one and then the voice directed my attention to a one of the a, a favorite painting that I have it's a portrait of a it's, a, it's actually called the starving boy and he's, you know sitting there with tears in his eyes and an empty uh, pot in this case but at any rate, I, you know, I just have a lot of feeling for that painting because, don't you see, I was relating to that little boy. 
So my attention was directed to the little boy, and the painting disappeared in front of my eyes again. And I didn't have to wait for the voice to answer this time, because I knew intuitively what the answer was in that. And you possess nothing. That meditation has probably been one of the most significant things. We call it the 11th step. But that meditation has probably been one of the most significant factors in my program. Because my reality now is, is that I know where I used to think I possessed people. I don't. I share people. I share the time that God, has, God as I understand him, has given me with a person, a thing, a place, you name it, but I don't own it. And now that I'm able to come from that attitude, life is much easier for me because I can allow you to be you. And it really doesn't even matter on my good days if you allow me to be me. I can just allow things to happen. I can allow what is to just happen. And that gets into another thing. All of these things are centered around not drinking, no matter what. Because in the early days, <laughs> did anybody ever use honey to kick alcohol? <laughs> Short story, my sponsor in August, a very cold night, saw me shaking like crazy. We marched off to the grocery store. He picked up a jar of honey, and I got to drink honey out of the jar in the parking lot and watch him laugh as I was trying to swallow it. <clears throat> I became so compulsive about honey. I never went anywhere without honey for about the first couple of months of my program. In fact, I used to find myself parking in cul-de-sacs and looking around, making sure nobody was looking, and then I'd take my jar of honey out of the glove compartment and have a couple of hits on it. It's just interesting as can be. <laughs> You know, I've always wanted to be somebody. And I still do, really. But it turns out, with the help of the steps, the book, with the people on the program, sponsors, it turns out that I've always wanted to be the best me I could be. And I never would have known that. I thought that I thought that, that the things I wanted were in businesses. And yet, I'll never forget one night sitting in my office, feet on my desk, bottle of brandy, small bottle of brandy, you see, because alcoholics drank big bottles of brandy. I think it was a fifth. <laughs> Thinking to myself, this is empty. This is really empty. So I knew it wasn't in the business. I've had my share of women. And I knew, I know that probably one of the greatest feelings of loneliness is to be with somebody who has expressed genuine love and not have any feelings. In the cars, in the houses, It's not there. And yet I've often heard in program, if I had, if I just had. And I can share with you that I have had. And I can share with you that while on program, I have had again. And it's not there. It's just not there. Emptiness comes from inside. I know that. And if I do not have a close conscious contact with the God that I understand, my, my reality is that I don't have a thing. Because I've had those things, and they had absolutely no meaning. Where I'm at now, um, I've changed my view about all 
those people involved in AA being dead. <laughs> uh, I'm no longer resigned to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, for those who know me a little better than most, I believe not in the punishing God that I thought once existed, but in a God who desires my happiness. I also believe that we are all connected with each other. And you see, one of the reasons I was able to get, a lot, to get away with as much as I did for as long as I did was because there was no connection between you and me. I could use you. I could do what I wanted to. I was after pleasing myself. But it's my belief now that each one of us is, in fact, connected. For you see, if I wasn't here, but I just simply sat in the room, or if I just simply walked by one of you, my very presence or your very presence has an effect, however great, however little. When I say I want to be the best me I possibly can, a lot of it still comes from the guilt because there are a lot of things that I did that I'm not really that proud of. But there's also a part of me that knows that if we are one, and not just alcoholics, but people, then we're in this thing together. And each, it's up to each one of us to find their truth and for the person who wants to find that truth, to help that person on the way. If you would have explained that philosophy to me a few years ago, well, I wouldn't have even stayed around to hear it, quite frankly. But that's where it is, at least as far as I'm concerned. A couple of interesting insights that have happened since I've been on program. I try and stay out of judgment as much as I possibly can. Because, you see, when it dawned on me, when the reality set in, then I more than drank too much, that I was an alcoholic. Then I thought that was probably the worst thing that could ever happen in my life. I had turned out just like my father, or stepfather, I should say who had turned out just like his mother, who had turned out just like her father. Incredible chain. And so I thought it was the worst thing that could happen to me. Today's reality is, it is the greatest strength that I have. Because you see, if it wasn't for the disease of alcoholism, because that's what it took to get me, or to make me aware that I was going nowhere. And I mean nowhere inside. I'm not talking about your material aspects. I mean nowhere inside. I mean the candle flickering and on its way out. Then I realized that that judgment was way off. That my disease was in fact probably one of the best things that happened to me. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. It does to me now. I try not to judge anybody anymore because I know, or at least, yeah, I know, that we're all doing the best we possibly can. You see, I believe in God's world we're all doing the best we possibly can or we, in fact, would be doing better. I also know, and I could, it took me an insight relatively uh, within the last couple of weeks. You know, you hear an awful lot about inventory taking. And certainly I've done my share of it. But that healing takes time. And I know an awful lot of people are like me. You know, I want to get well now. Because, I mean, I am 
ill, <laughs> and I got to get well as fast as I can, because <laughs> I mean I got some real problems there. But what I forgot was everybody else was trying to get well, <laughs> you know, and it takes time. And so when you hear a person coming up or sounding off or expressing anger or rage or whatever they're going through, they're going through a natural process of allowing the program and the God that they understand to heal them. And I couldn't understand that for a while. I'm also beginning to realize that I think I've got a little over five, well, yeah, a little over five and a half years. And this is meant to be encouraging because I have had a very good life in AA. I mean, I choose it to be that way. You know, I stay as close as I can to God, and I want to enjoy life. But I've also learned that the five and a half years I have is just an indication of what my life can be. And I think that I'm having... Uh, a good time is not the right word. Um, I'm enjoying life. Yeah, that would be the right word. I am enjoying life now. And the interesting aspect, because I used to look at the old farts like everybody else used to, you know, I mean, you hear this, I, I hear this on meeting level, God, you know. But when I look at people like Louis Trenier, a grateful alcoholic, and when I look at people like Fred Adams, and um, oh, I'm trying to think of his name, it's not coming, Dr. Fred. And I think to myself, these people are really happy. And all I have to do is practice the steps, read the book, be honest, and share with another human being, and I can grow. The most frightening thing that happened to me was not only did I stop growing when I was using drugs and alcohol, but in fact I was dying. And I had everything that I set out to have. Not good. I care for people now. I want to be a member of this program for as long as I can be a member of this program. If you're thinking about going out, if you're thinking about perhaps taking your life, if you're thinking that things aren't working out for you, know that I've gone through it and everybody in this room has gone through it. Know that I've survived and everybody else in this room has survived. We talk an awful lot, those people that, um, that I work with, go through it. Don't go around it. Don't go over it. Don't go under it. Go through it. And just before, or actually when it all seems hopeless, and when it all seems lost, the miracle is about to take place. You know, that all sounded like a bunch of baloney at one time. And when you're in pain and when you're hurting, it still sounds like a bunch of baloney. But there wouldn't be so many people in this program if it was. And I don't care how old or how young. I don't care how hooked. I don't care if you had a lot of problems and you got to visit a lot of institutions or if you didn't visit any. It's worth every step. Because if you get an opportunity to find out who you are through God as you understand Him, you're really quite a person. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.